Hello, beautiful light filled souls. I am so excited to be here with Curtis Childs, and he is the director of Off the Left Eye. I'll certainly put his links below in the show notes. And I'm also excited to let you know that the second annual Near Death Experience Summit is about to be available to you. So please check out that link. Lots of speakers and researchers at that event. And thank you for a great first week on the market with Angels in the OR. It's been so much fun connecting with people. But hi, Curtis, how are you? Hey, I'm doing really well. I want to say thanks for having me and congrats on your book being released. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's fun to connect with others. So one thing that I just want to begin, and this is my first question to you, but you say this on your YouTube channel. How do you think that um, Emanuel Swedenberg's writings relate to modern day seekers? I mean, obviously you get a lot of people commenting and connecting, but what is the connection between his writing and today? Yeah, well, I mean, what we do on our channel, it's really pretty weird. We, we dive really deep into this obscure uh, set of, of works from this 18th century scientist, right? So why would we spend so much time doing that? And why would we think we could put that on YouTube and anyone would be interested? I think it's because it does tie in so much. So I mean, this was before the, the, the whole near-death experience field was anything. You know, this is long before even talking about having spiritual experiences was, was necessarily cool. But Swedenborg was reporting stuff that is a lot like what people are now reporting in near-death experiences. When, um, so Life After Life, when Raymond Moody put out his first book where he kind of coined that phrase, he had, uh, I think it was four, four little chapters on this is stuff that's similar to the near-death experience. He had the Bible in there, the Tibetan the Book of the Dead. I think there's another one, um, Plato, I think was in there. Um, and then Swedenborg was one of them. Uh, which, which to me, being a, a, obviously a pretty big Swedenborg fan, it was like, yeah, he's in a real book. And so, so there was also, um, yeah, that Kenneth Ring, who was one of the, one of the founders of IANS, um, he wrote an introduction to this book about Swedenborg, where he was saying, you know, that, that in the near-death experience, we get to, to peek into the world in the afterlife. And Swedenborg was exploring sort of the, the whole house there, the whole. So what it seems to me is like, it's the same reality that Swedenborg in his way and his time with his uh, way of looking at things and recording things was looking at the same reality that now people who have these experiences are seeing. And I think a lot of people find comfort in uh, the way that those two seem to reinforce each other. But then also Swedenborg, because he's uh, as academic as he is and as structured and almost like fanatical about detail as he is, he in a way, I once had somebody involved, um, in a near-death experience group in California say that Swedenborg is almost helpful, sort of like a backbone, to, to, to stick different elements together on, to help, okay, wh this is what happened, why, why did somebody see that, what does it mean? Uh, so I, I think that not only is it, is it connected like that, but it's also providing some, some missing pieces for people at times that can help give them what we're trying to give, which is this holistic picture of life that, that comforts people. Yeah, and one thing that I'm curious about, because I don't know enough about uh, Swedenborg, is what personal experiences did he have that brought him these insights? So, yeah. you know, he has a lot to say about heaven and the afterlife, for instance, and angels, and, and I'm really curious what his experiences were like. Yes, and he, the cool thing about Swedenborg is you have, I don't I feel like probably the most complete record of somebody's inner life ever, because he was not just publishing the books that we now know as his writings, but he was cataloging every little spiritual experience he ever had. And he, he basically had a 30 year period where he was having these things every day. But, but not only that, but you get to see the way that he got into it. So it's actually a pretty fascinating story. Uh, it begins with, he was keeping a journal, like a travel journal. You know, where he was, at the time, very successful scientist, also well-connected in the circles of nobility. He was running Sweden's mining economy at the time, which mining was this huge industry, so a position of, and Sweden was a world power at the time, so a uh, big deal, and he was just keeping track of, you know, I was in London, I was in Amsterdam doing these things, but we, someone recovered this journal, so you can see he begins to, at some point, go from just where he's going to start recording his dreams, and he would say, I had this dream... And, and slowly, as it evolves, you get to watch in real time, he starts to psychoanalyze his dreams. I think this, 
I saw a black dog in this dream. I think it might have meant this, which is not, there wasn't, there wasn't Freud back then. There wasn't the, the idea of psychology was still sort of in its infancy, but he was looking for meaning in these. And you see entry by entry, it progressed into going to, the dreams get more and more vivid. They get more and more personal. They get more and more challenging. And then it begins to, the veil lifts, as they say. And he begins to have these, uh, the, the, the two worlds connect. He starts to have these experiences that aren't while he's asleep. You know, and it, you see it progress from there. He has a couple of sort of seminal experiences where he has really powerful visions of, of God. And it's, it completely changes everything he was doing. I mean, he, nobody knows who Swedenborg is these days, but you would have if he hadn't had these experiences because he was, he was like a Newton kind of guy. He was going to go down as this great scientist, but he started saying, oh, I'm, I, I've, I'm taking these, what we would now call out-of-body uh, experiences or astral projection or whatever. I, I'm having these. This is the conversations I'm having. I'm recording these down. These are the, the principles that I was shown. This is sort of my not scientific study, but my, my um, really careful de- description of everything that's, that's on that side. And so this is what's going on. And as you can imagine, the, the scientific community just dumped him really fast. And a lot of people thought he was nuts. A lot of people still do. But it was, he's very adamant that this is not, it's not just theology where I'm sitting there and thinking about, thinking about angels and thinking about God. I'm reporting to you what, what I'm experiencing. And, and a lot of times what, what that experience means. So it's, it's, it's in a way like a travelogue of his, although he frames it, he tries to put it in these very neat packages that address the big questions of life. I, I love that description because I think people in academia, even today, and I've talked about this before, they caution me not to come out and talk about angels, <laughs> not that's, to come out and right. talk about these things. <laughs> I can only imagine in his time period. I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. He must have been completely ostracized on some level. He was, there was, uh, his works were put on trial in Swedenborg. And it wasn't just like a reputation thing at the time because Sweden was, and I'm not a historian, but this is how I understand it. Sweden was a theocracy. The, the church and the state were the same thing. He was, uh, it's not quite treason, but it was to the point where, yeah, his, his works, not he himself, his works were put on trial. It's called the Gothenburg Trials. He was pretty well connected, so he wasn't ever really in danger uh, of suffering major consequences, but he got a ton of backlash. A lot of um, contemporary authors and people who were friends just tore him apart in, in interviews and, and reviews and all these kinds of things. He did have some people who embraced his material and saw value in it, but he definitely paid a, a heavy price. Um, and yeah, it's, it's even today when you have people like yourself, like uh, even Alexander, who are you know, in, within uh, academic and medical fields coming out, you, you can get a lot of positive attention, but you still, you still pay a, a price for that. So he, he apparently thought this is worth it, no question. You never get the sense that he was second guessing. He, he felt like what I'm sharing here is much more important than my reputation. And, and it's not that he said, okay, I had this silly life before where I studied the physical world and that doesn't matter. It's only spiritual. Everything he learned, he was, he was uh, basically the pinnacle of, at, at the pinnacle or close to like all the fields of science. Because back then, science was not nearly as sophisticated as it is now. Right now, you can be really smart and all you can manage is to really know well this tiny slice of a field because it's so complicated. But back in his day, our understanding of the world, scientific in- instruments were pretty crude. So you could really know a lot about everything. That was sort of the end of that era. So one of the fields that he was uh, leading in was anatomy. And if you look at his spiritual writings and the way he describes how we relate to angels and to the spiritual world, his, his understanding of the human body is absolutely the framework for that. And his understanding of all the time you see his scientific understanding allowing him to understand spiritual concepts. And he, he looked at it as this was all building the framework, you know, for me to be, be able to understand this stuff. So similarly in our lives, the stuff we learn about this life, we're all, we're all here in the physical world, that, that can be a very important foundation to getting the higher stuff. So it's not that he said, I was wasting my time, but he also said, I have no need to pursue uh, being revered and honored in these fields. I'd much rather deliver this crucial information that he felt like is going to help people's, people's souls or their spirits or their, their minds to free them from sort of the illusion that, that we live in. Oh, fascinating. It reminds me a little bit of Walt Whitman, who, you know, changed so much on this 
transcendental level of connecting with nature and people thought were horrified. So he was really attacked by a lot of people yeah. in that sense. But another thing that you said that fascinated me is people have put uh, meditators and monks in MRIs and studied their brains while they're meditating and they have connected science to the phenomenon of spirituality now. And it's, it's fascinating that he did that. What uh, connections did he find between the anatomy and connecting? Okay, so let's let's get really weird here. Um, the the like, so f- first of all, he says that if you think about heaven, he would talk about heaven as uh, it's it's complex. It's it's essentially a state of mind. Like you you, it, a lot of people think that when they hear heaven, they think of a place in the afterlife. And he very much visited places in the afterlife that you would call heaven you know, that that are beautiful and everyone there is loving and happy and interconnected. But it's. The, it's almost like the place is secondary to the mindset. The mindset of heaven is when, you know, you say somebody, like oh, that person was like an angel to me. When people are being selfless and they're being thoughtful and you can tell that they're not puffed up with pride, uh, that, that's the mindset of heaven. So he says that actually if you look at heaven, if you needed to have like a schematic of it or a representation, you, the human body is the model of heaven. Because if you think about how does the body work, what is the body? It's this conglomerate of all these different parts that are absolutely committed to each other. So you think about the liver. It, it, it gets everything it needs from the whole and is entirely devoted to giving its all to the, the specific process in the whole. And you have to have that for a body to work. The lungs need to do what they do. But if any one part of the body decides I'm just I'm just in it for myself then the whole thing collapses so that he said that 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 the human body in a way we are all like wearing the heaven the shape of heaven in us so he would he would talk to angels you know and he would say like well these these angels I was talking to corresponded with or, or were representative of the cerebrum because they were part of sort of gathering intelligence and wisdom in heaven. So they uh, are fulfilling the function to heaven that the cerebrum fulfills to the body. So very, very specific, very bizarre, but once you dig into it, very cool stuff. Uh, and, and certainly everything he knew about the way the body worked allowed him to, to place that better. So there's one example of how he did it. Yeah, and that's fascinating to me too, because when I saw my angels you know, during surgery, I was struck by how intelligent they were. And intelligence was the very first characteristics that, that I, I realized about the angels. And it's interesting that he says it connects to the brain. That makes sense to me. And, and then remind them to go to nature was another message that I got during the near-death experience. And I think when we are more in touch with our bodies and our health and and our connection to nature, then we do experience a more blissful existence. And I've, I've noticed, and myself included, lots of near-death experiencers are trying to bring the energy of heaven to earth. And I think they are hoping to do that through people being more in touch with the mindfulness practice or um, you know, being more in touch with their body. So it's interesting. Yeah, well, in nature. So, I mean, when I was starting out in college, I wanted to study conservation biology. Like, I loved nature and I loved thinking about it and, and learning its systems and being in it. And that, that's what I want to do. So, it's been really gratifying to me to see Swedenborg's take on why we have this spiritual connection to nature. And he talked about, and this is another place where sort of his scientific background came in handy. He, he said basically that um, everything you see in nature physically is, is representing something spiritual. That if you know how to read it right, you could learn everything about heaven and God and life after from, from looking at how nature is. Like, so, so for example, a correspondence means that something is playing a role physically that its counterpart plays spiritually. So if you think of, people talk about the being of light you know, people go and see the being, the, the being in the light. Some people call that God in the near death experience. Swedenborg uh, says that, that you have a correspondence with the sun. If you look at the way the sun powers ecosystems on earth, right? Everything, pretty much everything. I know scientists are discovering some things deep at hydrothermal vents that they don't know of that. But we'll just say for this conversation, the sun's energy powers all life on earth and that you have to, you know, be able to capture that in order to live in the same way. God is sending out, just like there's light and heat coming out of the sun, uh, love and truth are constantly emanating from the light. And the way that we, the way that, diff, you know, if you look at an ecosystem, 
there are certain organisms that can harvest that light energy. You know, plants can harvest that and get it into a form that then animals can use and so on and so on. Similarly, you know, there's, there's certain people that can understand truth in a certain way and then take it and make it into a form that other people can use. And you, you get this living picture of the grand scale of how the human race can operate, but also inside yourself that he says like the leaves of a tree are like the ideas we have in our mind, our spiritual concepts. So if you have the right concept put in there, you ever had it, you've been taught some kind of principle, but suddenly if you, you feel like, oh, I get what that means. So that feels alive to me. That's like that leaf catching the light and bringing it, you know, being able to bring that energy into the body. So that it's just like this endless kind of, you don't have to have your, your nose in a Swedenborg book to learn about it. You can go out there where, where it's awesome in nature and, and just start to pick out, if you have the basic framework, start to pick out what it's telling you about life. And that I, I think that's part of why it's so nice, you know, being in nature. I love that. And I've, I've actually thought about that principle, you know, the light did seem like the sun, you know, God did seem like this powerful energy and light that was flying toward. And so as I walk around and miss God, I do look at the sun as this symbol and go, okay, let me soak up that love. Let me soak up that happiness. And, and even, you know, you notice that people who live in areas where there isn't as much sunlight need the lamps in order to, uh, not feel depressed. And so I'm, I'm one of those. Yep. Really? Well, I, I definitely have a, um, my wife gave me like, it's called the happy light, this little like lamp on there that, that the turn on, it's got like the full spectrum. And I do feel like sometimes like I'm sitting at this desk right now and there's a lot of, we have a lot of lights here cause this is where we broadcast our show out of. And sometimes because there's so many panels around here, I'll just come down here to work. If it's, if it's not sunny out to be like, okay, I need as much light as I can get. So I definitely feel like I'm with you on that. So. Yeah, and color therapy as well. You know, walking around in nature and you know, seeing different colors uh, changes our mood. And that's fascinating. So what did he, I want to go back to angels, uh, if you don't mind. What did he say beyond uh, the corresponding part of the brain with angels? What did uh, he have to say about their role in our lives? Uh, so uh, Swedenborg would, he started trying to publish this very technical stuff about spiritual growth, where he would say, look, this, these are the steps we take to what he, what he calls regenerate or, or you know, go from what we would now call sort of ego-based, self-centered, closed-in life to a life where you're letting everything good in and, and loving people and value what's really important. He was trying to give us these sort of very technical steps to, to get there. But a lot of people, once they caught on, that he was seeing angels. They just wanted to know like, what's going on with that? What's up with the angels? Actually, initially he was publishing anonymously because he didn't want to get, you know, build up a cult of personality or something, but eventually somebody figured it out. And so people said, what, what about angels? What about angels? And that's when he published his book, uh, his books about heaven and and all this stuff. So he paints this picture of um, so there's angels everywhere. Uh, there are, he talks about t- two angels being with every person permanently. That there's, and he actually talks about there being sort of a, there are two main parts in us, which we now would probably say like the heart and the mind. That there's the intellectual aspect of us and the volitional aspect of us. And there's sort of an angel which each of the, with each of those parts. That there's, that there's sort of an angel uh, working with the mind, an angel working with the heart. And it's not, it all gets very complicated because, you know, each angel was part of a, a community. They're almost like an ambassador for a, for a larger community. This is like our connection point in. It's sort of like your customer service rep or something like that. But they, that. Yeah, uh, if you didn't have that, that connection is, is both what you think of like, oh, they're, they're, they're trying to help us, but it's also that's part of the machine that allows us to be conscious. Like you have to have that. If they stepped away, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to think or exist or, or do anything that, that, that life itself, you know, you've heard people talk about there's one life, you know, uh, one love that, that he described a system where, you know, we've got God radiating out this, this love and truth that are the essence of life. And it actually goes through heaven into us that we're, we're sort of in this chain. So those angels are, are allowing that, that life to come in with us. And we have, we've done a lot of shows about the different ways that he describes how you can kind of, um, see those angels show up and that he says, if you, when you're getting um, good feelings and good thoughts, that that's heaven, you know, that's heaven talking with you uh, or, or, yeah, or enabling you to have those or, or with you on those. And so to me, that's kind of cool to think, 
because it's so at times it's so obviously I'll get an idea that I just never would have thought of, you know, or, or I get a feeling that it just feels like uh, it's just sweeping across me and, and just seems like so far above my usual petty stuff that I'm like, Oh, that's cool. I want to, you know, I, I, uh, so I'll just do a little acknowledgement. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's, that's probably heaven there. Um, so there, there's a million things I could say about the specifics, but, but he says that angels are constantly are most interested in what our motivations are for things like not exact necessarily results, uh, but why are we doing what we're doing and trying to get that, trying to get the, the most um, altruistic, healthy motives that we can get. What are your overall goals in life? Not in like a scorecard kind of way. He actually makes the fascinating point that, that angels who might think are really interested in, you know, what's, what's good and what's bad are you doing really don't uh, are very much, um, not interested in picking out faults at all. Not, not really, just sort of like he says, he describes a process where he's, he gets to experience kind of the awakening process after death, what that would be like, um, sort of like his own near-death experience, but he wasn't under physical distress at the time. And he said, like, the angels didn't really care about my misconceptions or my faults at all. Not that they didn't notice them, but just not that, but they just weren't worried about it, you know? So, so this very cool, loving, love, loving yet wise presence. Interesting. And that makes me wonder the moments when they are entering people's lives. For instance, there was a, a moment and I, I talk about this where I think I saw angels in the flesh, you know, they took on human form and I needed comfort at this moment. And so it was a heart moment. So these two people reached out to me in an unusual, funny way. There were two homeless guys who gave me a couple of uh, 20s on my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, I got money from homeless people. But they they looked like they were not from this planet. And and as they walked away, I thought, wow, those might have been angels in the flesh. And that seemed to be a moment of heart connection. But then you're talking about ideas as well. So maybe the particular angels are working on the heart at, at times and the mind at times. I, I would think so. Cause it, it seems like you got to have both, you know, you got to have these, if it's all, it's, if it's all learning and you never get to just feel that love behind it, you know, it, it won't go, but if it's all love and there's no direction, it's funny because we'll get people coming to our channel who very much can be in need of one or the other that there are some people who want to be in community and they want to comfort. They want somebody to listen. Um, But there's other people who are thirst, almost thirsty for knowledge. And I was talking about correspondences before and Swedenborg says that, that love sort of corresponds to food. So it's like the way that your body needs food, the soul needs love and the way your body needs water, the soul needs truth. So if you don't have both, you're not going to be happy, but there's a time if you're really thirsty and all you're getting is food, that's not going to do it. So it's sort of this, the right balance at the right time. And I would assume that that's what heaven is, is trying to give us, you know, when we need it. How fascinating. I tell people when they want to connect with angels or ancestors to feel the energy too, because Mm -hmm. I believe that the energy of the presence is one way to connect because it's really distracting to actually see angels. (laughs) (laughs) I've asked for that to go away, you know, pretty quickly after my near death experience. When I saw it, I I didn't want to see a very crowded sidewalk. You know, I didn't want to be in that constant state of, of seeing that. And I think the energy though, is if you feel love coming through that veil and you feel it attaching to you, then that's the way to begin to start communing with them and to begin asking them questions and going a little deeper. And it sounds like um, Swedenborg went very deep you know, with uh, what he asked. And, and it is, would that be like what he does in some of the texts is just go incredibly deep into the experience? Yes, that's right. He, he, and so he'll deliver it to you in a couple of different ways. Sometimes he'll, he'll just tell you a story, <clears throat> excuse me, when it, where he'll say, you know, I, 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 he'll, he'll describe getting to go to these groups of angels that are having these deep conversations about particular topics. And he, he relays back, you know, what they, what they said and what their conclusions were. Um, there are other times when he's just laying out principles but then you can you can actually go and read so i said he had his journal of dreams right in the beginning but after that he kept a journal of his spiritual experiences for the next like 20 years so you have it's it's i think 5000 entries or something like that <clears throat> and you get 
that he didn't actually publish that, but people found it after his death and have subsequently published it. Sorry, I hope, hope you don't mind Swedenborg. But in there you get kind of the raw data. This is just, this is, this is who I saw. This is what they were doing. This is this representation that appeared to me. And, and sometimes, oftentimes to me, that's the most interesting material because it gives you these really detailed insights into the way that he saw the spiritual dynamics around him working. And you can tell that it was a lot of what went into the other things that he published was that this, that's sort of his data gathering operation. And, and then he synthesizes it, but yeah, it was, and he was, he, he believed, seemed to believe, and you can see by the way he was publishing that he had like a particular goal, which was to lay out an, an understanding of, of how life works. So he was a lot of times searching for a particular thing. He'll say, I was meditating on a particular idea you know, trying to understand a concept. And as he was doing that, an angel will come up and say, oh, do you want to learn more about that? Here, I'll take you over here. So he was trying to fill something out um, at the same time. So it was all sort of under a, under a banner, but, but he would very much also be ready for this spontaneous nature of, oh, I've got to rethink this and reshuffle this. He had whole books that he wrote, but then never published because he felt like, no, I don't, I've got to refine that. I've got to change how that goes in. Uh, so it must have been like just a really fascinating trip to be on. So this is a little bit off topic, but I wanted to talk about your channel and near-death experiencers and how so many people come to this information because of grief. And it's interesting what grief does to us. It works on a, on a heart level and a mind level. A lot of people have a spiritual awakening in the moment of losing someone close to them or a spiritually transformative experience or the, the loss begins to work on them in an emotional way. So what have you found that people are gathering and and really benefiting from, from this when they come to the place uh, with grief, you know, that they want to understand more. I, losing somebody that you love opens up. Um, and, and I lost, I, my, my sister died, you know, when I was younger and I, I didn't have a, a, an experience then, but it, it opens up this, these huge questions uh, and this huge longing to how do you correct this or how do you, how do you understand life again? And, and also, how do you know that they're okay? I mean, that's, that's the greatest draw that I see. And I see, we see this in people. The whole effort that we're doing now really began centered around that. Actually, before our YouTube channel really got going, I was running a Facebook group uh, where we were just, we were just tr actually was started thinking about near-death experiences because we were at, at the Swedenborg Foundation, which is where I work, we're saying, well, you know, we do think there'd be a lot of people who would benefit from, who like near-death experiences, who would benefit from Swedenborg's material. So let's just set up, uh, they, they told me, just, just try to see if you can get people interested in, in Swedenborg's book on Facebook. So we set up this site where we said, look, these near-death experiences say these similar things to Swedenborg. You can read more here. And I thought it would just be like you try to get people through to the books. But right away, it became a sharing group. The people wanted to tell their story. They wanted to talk about their spiritual experiences. But a lot of the times, it was grief. And still, by, by far the most common feedback we get is, oh, this, this is helping me as I get through the loss of my fiance or the, the loss of my child. And th our most popular videos are all around our most popular video we ever had is, is why don't our loved ones who have died communicate with us more? Because you're thinking, okay, there's somebody and we used to be right close to each other and they could talk to me and I could talk to them and now they're gone and, and I'm devastated. And if you're saying that there really is like an afterlife and they're still around, I would love, why aren't they coming through? Is it because they don't care? Or is it, and, and, and why do some people get, experiences where they get to see and, and, and feel that and, and get reaffirmed, but I don't. So, so we just, we're giving some thoughts on that. Um, and I what, think. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Because I felt lucky and blessed to, when my father died, to have pretty strong connections with both him and my grandparents. And when people who are very close to a parent or a kid and they don't get those confirmations, I don't know what to say. I just yeah. feel bad for them. You know, <laughs> yeah. I why aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really rough. And there's some people who, who, uh, you know, I know of somebody who, who lost a, a child recently and they're just trying and trying to get some kind of sign. And even like when I was saying that, that when my, my sister died, um, there was actually a relative of mine who was getting 
sort of spiritual experiences in, involving her, but, but my, my family wasn't. So it does raise these questions and can actually compound people's grief, you know, if, if they have a, a belief in the afterlife. So what we, were, what we were going through there and what it seems to be is, backing up for a second, you know, we, we know that the, the physical world runs by laws. It's a, it's a system that, like, even though you and I are here to talk about spiritually uplifting things and we think we're on the side of good or something, if something's broken in my camera, it's not going to work. Doesn't matter how much good we're trying to do. If the, if the system is in, in place, uh, we, we can't get the signal through. And the spiritual world that Swedenborg describes has the same kind of structure to it, that there are things that have to be in place in order to get through. And it, it's not it's not necessarily personal, but if the whole way life is where there's a physical world and we're pretty much shut off from the spiritual world, except for um, in situations like, like you've been describing having, uh, that's not how life is supposed to be. Life is supposed to be that, as Swedenborg says, you know, back sort of in an earlier time in the human race, there was open communication between the worlds. It would be normal for people to sort of know when they're going to die and be able to communicate afterwards, just like you'd think it should be. But there has been, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of clouds in the human heart and mind. Like overall, as a human race, we've become, uh, we've distanced ourselves from the kind of love and truth that opens you up to that. And as such, the, the link between the worlds has suffered because of that. And, and um, sometimes for our protection, what, it's sort of like you say, why can't I go and drink from the stream near my house? Well, because th- there's this whole industrial history that we have that's polluted that thing. It doesn't, it's not because of something you did, but you just, the wa- groundwater is not always safe where it is now. Similarly, even if you have a very good love for somebody who's died and they want to connect with you, it's not always possible for, for a million reasons. So th- basically that was our conclusion. It's just like, it's not personal. It's a very complicated thing. And when it can happen, it does, but there, there are good, essentially there are good reasons uh, for why, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I always joked that the reason I could hear family members or see ghosts after the near-death experience is that my spirit was loosened, you know, after yep. a near-death experience, and that I was just a little bit, it was a little bit easier for me to cross the veil because I understood it, and if you've never crossed the veil, you know, then I think a lot of times people do hear actual communication from their loved ones, but they brush it aside as, oh, that's just wishful thinking. You know, they'll hear their voice in their head, Right. And they say, oh, that's just an echo of their voice when it actually might be communication. And then the, they might, it, take them, it might take them a while to interpret what that meaning was at that moment. Yeah. And, and also that everything is, has love behind it, even if it's hard for us to see right now. Like, so, for, yeah, there's been a lot of times when I really wanted a spiritual experience for, for a lot of different reasons, like when dealing with grief and loss also, um, when I was dealing with a lot of uh, mental health stuff and depression, and I was just really desperate for something like that. Um, so I wanted at the time, but but taking the big picture, how do I know exactly how that's going to affect me psychologically? And if the point of, Swedenborg describes like the point of what he calls divine providence or what God is trying to do is to basically get my spirit as healthy as it can be, really set, set up my spirit for the best possible, that, that I learn the ways of love and truth in my particular way, the best I can through life. How do I know that I'm not sure, I can't be sure that that would be the best thing for me then. Maybe part of it is because I'm having to you know, just learn from people like you in Swedenborg about this other side, that allows me to then communicate it to people in a particular way that I couldn't otherwise. There, million, there could be a million reasons that I don't know or see, but I can trust that it's not that God is saying, well, you know, whatever, I'm too busy, or, you know, you, if you had done better in, in Boy Scouts, I wasn't actually a Boy Scout, then I would have done it. Uh, that, there's, that, that everything is done thinking about what's best for the, the eternal state. You know, that this, that this is going to be, in the end, you'll see why. That's, and that's always how it is in near-death experiences. That I remember there was this cool one that, that my wife was watching by somebody named Beverly Brodsky. And she was, at the time, um, really, uh, really disturbed by the Vietnam War. I just mentioned this in an episode that we did. And, and she was saying, um, I could never, I couldn't justify a picture of God that would allow that to happen. So she had her near-death experience, crashed on her motorcycle, got there, and she said, I got it. Like, I understood the reasons for things and how it was going to be okay. And 
that in the end, I've never heard of anyone who had an NDE who came back and said, they don't know what they're doing up there. Like, you know, it's, it's like there, there are reasons. And I, I'm just at a point where I can, I can believe that there's, that there's good reasons and that, that it's worth it. If you, something that, that Swedenborg says, that there's no ratio between what's temporary and what's, what's forever. So even though we got, there may be things that need to be done in a confusing or painful way in the short term, if you, if something eternal comes out of that, in the end, I, this is, I have a lot of questions and, and anger and hurt that I would have directed at God, you know, because of just life, the things we all do, the things we go through. But I know that in the end, I'm, when I finally get, see it all, and I'm going to be like, hey, thanks for staying strong and sticking to the plan. Because yeah. in, you know, believe it or not, you were right. <laughs> like you, so that, that's, what, that's what I think the message is, is that it's done. It's not neglect. It's not, uh, some people are better than others. It's not that it's unfeeling. It's love and dealing, making the best out of a tough situation where we're all here um, in free will. And sometimes we're, people are paying for the mistakes of the human race, but, but it's going to be okay and worth it in the end, you know? And, and time, that concept of time, it makes me wonder if maybe that's why primitive cultures were better at crossing that veil because... Yeah they might have premonitions in nature of what was coming next and they might not be as tied to their phones and, and the <laughs> concept of time. And I know that it was a hard concept for me when I came back after the near death experience time itself, I would be in the future in the past and, you know, just, be, I, it was hard to pin me down, you know, in one place in time. And I think that's a confusing part of our culture that yeah. we're held to that standard. So that might be part of it as well. And I always tell people who are grieving, it might be 10 years and then you start getting those signs, you know, and then that connection opens up and that's the right time and the right moment for you. And you might just have to wait a lot of times. Right. And that's, and that's so fascinating too, because yeah, Swedenborg is very adamant that time and space are sort of properties of what's lower and, and physical and that spiritually instead of time it's like state of mind and that, that, that you know a lot like what, what you're describing and that part of how we can another thing he says about angels is that we can be developing the same mind while, while we're here right now and that part of what he keeps saying is try to distance at, at times you know, you've got to be practical you've got to do stuff but see if you can think a little outside space and time and, and get into that state but we get into that state sometimes where you love what you're doing um, you know, let, let's, you know, I don't know how, how you're enjoying this interview, but at times I'm sure you've had interviews where it's like, it's over already. You know, that, that was an hour already that that's kind of when we've drifted outside of, of time, you know? Oh no, I'm fascinated by this interview. And it, you know, it's, these concepts are amazing to me and my mind goes in so many different directions. It's sometimes hard to pick the right question, <laughs> but you know, when I'm, I'm thinking about, angels working on us in particular ways. You're right, when you connect with the heart, or when you connect with this grand idea that is beyond time and space, then they are excited about your altruism and, and your caring. In fact, you know, I joke, and this is the honest truth, but one of the reasons why I wrote my book is I know after my death, there's going to be a teenager who picks up my book and I see him very clearly and he's lost and and something about my words makes sense to him. And then he'll connect with me in the afterlife for a minute and go, do I really have this connection with the author? Yeah. And I'll be able to talk with them. And I, I'm like, that's part of the reason. You know, I know it ahead of time. As weird as that is, this one no, person. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, that, that's so cool. That, that I did, okay, this is going to mean something to, to him then. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, but, but that's being outside of time and outside of it in a, in a really weird way. You know, and if I say that out loud too often, <laughs> I know it doesn't make sense in a, you know, real world <laughs> business oriented world, you know, but, but the spirit knows what's most important. And that might be the one glowing part of that whole story was that one kid, you know, in his life and how it changed and what he did. Yeah. And if you think about the, him getting some kind of, eternal thing like that's that's really valuable that that could be more worth it than a million other courses of action that you could take so in a way that's like it, it is business sense but like from a you're, you're looking at the difference between well i can spend a bunch of money now or i can invest it you know that that that's sort of thinking outside time uh to, to develop savings but you're doing that spiritually which is really cool yeah to know these things is is fascinating so 
what did um, what were his concepts about God? You know, you mentioned nature and the light, but I'm sure there's a lot more to the writings and a lot more to his his work. Yeah. So, um, well, there's a lot to say. Uh, basically, uh, things you've probably heard before. God is love, but but also God is like a person that you can love. The, the God, and I think this is pretty similar to what I hear about a lot of when people are in the light, uh, which, I, which I've, I feel like near-death experiences for me have filled out the emotional component of a lot of Swedenborg's writings because he'll describe what's going on technically, and sometimes he will communicate the emotions involved, but just it's, it's a diff, it's, it was written in Latin. It was hundreds of years ago. To hear people today talk about what's what it's like to be in the the presence of the light um people will say that this this being knew me and and loved me unconditionally i i had heard one talk to one guy who said this was like christmas morning and all the times i've ever been in love and everything i jacked up times a million like that's what it's like being in the light so that that is but but the light is like a a person you know it's some somebody that you can that you can love so that's god according to Swedenborg. And, and then he goes into a lot of detail about just how, like, that's the most important thing to know. And that's the thing you focus on as, and that this regeneration or redevelopment is, is really us forming a partnership with God or a union with God. That that's what Providence is trying to do is bring us closer and get it so that, you know, any relationship with somebody, your lives are getting more and more in sync and you're, you're coming together on common interests. And you really, uh, if, if you have, especially if you have similar things you believe in, not necessarily like religious beliefs, but like you believe in a, a cause or something like that, that can really pull you together. So God, God's cause is the, the, the long-term happiness of everybody. So the more that you love that rather than, so if I go around loving that rather than re- being really self-focused and uh, I'm promoting myself and who cares what happens to the other people, the more I have something in common with God. And Swedenborg actually says that that desire to, there's only, as I said before, there's one love that God is, is, is love for everybody. So when I'm feeling that love for everyone, that's me sharing that, you know, that that's coming through. So um, God does that. God, a lot of the classic descriptors of God, God is, is everywhere, has, is all powerful, knows everything that would be true according to Swedenborg. Um, But, but a lot of cool details about, um, just how interested God is in, in the minutia of our development. And you think about everything that's going on. I used the body before as a metaphor. We, I, right now I'm talking to you during this interview. I have no idea what's going on in there. I don't know how neurons work. I don't know how much ATP do I have in my body. I don't know. But the body is managing that on this incredible level. Even if I want to gesticulate, I don't know how that hand works, but there's all this care in there to let me flail around while I'm talking. There's that, but much more so in our, in our spiritual development, that God is very, the, to what to us just seems like, oh, I, I sort of think about these things. This is who I am. There's so much going on in there that God is carefully bringing and creating the right conditions for much like a, you know, a, a fetus is growing in the womb. We, our spirits are growing right now, and God is like utmostly concerned with making sure that that, that goes well for the purpose of us reaching the state of heaven you know, reaching happiness and peace and joy. Essentially it's God is the living desire to make, make you as happy as possible and happy as possible for the, for the reasons that, that can be sustainable and ongoing. You know, you can get an, an initial rush of like ego joy when something goes well for you, but actual peace comes through tapping into this love. And, and that's what God is, is interested in doing. So there's a couple of, of Swedenborg, God thoughts. Wow. And as I'm listening to this, I, I wondered, you know, in my near death experience, I was told to come back and be a teacher. And I knew that the classroom had something to do with God. And so I would listen to God. And I thought early on, okay, what's the first thing I need to do? And I thought no one needs to feel uncomfortable. They need to be happy, you know, like in order to yeah. learn, they need to be anxiety free. They need to be in a state where they feel supported, non, you know, there's no stress, and that that's the first key to doing well in school. So I said, even if I'm not the greatest teacher in the world, I'm going to be nice, and they're going to have fun, you know, and that's going to be, and not that that's all chaos, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, that's kind of the basis of de-stressing everyone. And I realized pretty quickly that that is, that must be what God wants on some level, is not for people to feel beaten down and 
you know, that they're not going to perform well. They're not going to bring their gifts to the world if they're beaten down and told that they're not good. That they're going to thrive if they're told that they have abilities, if they're shown, you know, what they can do in this world. And so that's that's interesting, that little connection. Yeah, and you, you know, that you have to get that right in order for them to be receptive to being taught. And another way that you could start the Swedenborg on God conversation is that he says, God is love and wisdom. Just we were talking about the sun is heat and light. And that you, he talks a lot about how, you know, if it's winter, if you live in a, a place where it gets cold, you can have plenty of light, but because of the angle of the earth, there's not heat in those, in those rays. So nothing can grow. Uh, or you can, it can be really hot, but if, if you're, you've got a plant under a box, it's not gonna be able to grow because the light's not getting to it. What God is, is, um, a, an intense love for everyone, but also a very intent, uh, omnipotent or, or omniscient wisdom of knowing exactly how people work. So like you're talking about there that people aren't going to be able to thrive if you don't give them the right conditions. That's, that's insight into what the human condition is. So like God is, is wanting to get the right thing done and knowing how to do it. And it's sort of the, the marriage of those two things that goes back to, I said, we have like a, a heart and a mind and the angels are trying to get, you know, get, get interface on both of those things. That's because we are sort of this, the smallest image of the, the divine design. You know, we, we are, you know, aspiring to, to be sort of like a, a partner in, in those things too. So that, I, I love the idea of you like setting people up in the classroom to, to fe- have sort of, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy, like make sure those needs are met. And then we'll, then that, that's the right soil to plant these ideas in. Yeah, that I listened to God and that seemed to be the right condition. And, and so I thought, okay, from there. And then people don't need a ton of love. That's what has struck me in the most powerful ways we talk about, you know, giving love and love, love, love. But there's so little of it sometimes that even if you just give a tiny bit, it magnifies someone's world and it changes their world. You know, if you tell them something good about themselves or, or just demonstrate love, then they grow almost like a plant. And it's, it's really amazing to see. That's cool. That's so awesome. Yeah. But, but I love that description of God as uh, all loving because that's all I felt, you know, that in that afterlife. And I also like the idea of near death experiencers. We get so excited about it, you know, the, yeah. the ineffable descriptions of, of God. It, we, we could talk forever, but it is an emotion. You know, it is this heart activation that we know God to be home, we know God to be truth, we know God to be the most loving force imaginable, and nothing can compare. And that's the weirdest thing, as you can spend the rest of your life, and you can have great love, you can have a great romantic partner, you can have a great family, you can have all these things, you can give love to the world, but God's love is always superior. It's always more powerful. Yeah, and I, what I love about that is, um, God is universally accessible that everybody, if you if, if there's going to be something that's better than everything else, if, if, if the best thing, the best feeling you could ever have in life was being the best basketball player of all time, one person gets to be that, you know, <laughs> um, or, or it's yeah, be, be, being the, the most famous revered figure in, in history. One person gets to have that, but God is like, everybody can have that. And, and, and that being the source of, of greatest joy. I love that, that, that anybody can, can reach that. And it makes me wonder, you know, do the birds in the sky, do the dogs feel God's love? You know, we, we don't know what their receptors are like, but I imagine that they do sometimes. They just feel that, that love. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> I like the idea of my dog, like just sitting there, like when he's lying in the sunshine, like out in the back garden, that he's feeling this like peace radiate through him, you know, from that love. Uh, that would be that would be really cool. So, connections. I guess I just have to, since you know I talk about near death experiences a lot. But could you tell me a little bit more about the connections between near death experiences and Swedenborg's work? Sure. Um, and there's been. Uh, there have been some cool, cool books written on this. There was a book by Leon Rhodes called Tunnel to Eternity, which that's actually the one that Kenneth Ring wrote that introduction to, which goes through the, the similarities there. That I mentioned Raymond Moody's Life After Life. A couple of ones beyond the, the, you know, the light 
light and God connection, I think is really important that people talk about beings of light. And Swedenborg is so adamant about his whole chapters about the light in heaven and why that's important. Uh, the, the kind of communication you can have with, with angels, uh, he talks about spiritual communication being able to happen through thought, you know, um, as well as being able to uh, learn, communicate much more efficiently and quickly spiritually. I know people will talk about like, I just got a download of information. He also even talks about people will, people will have a, an experience where they feel like, oh, I knew this already. I already, like, how did I? And he'll talk about when you come into a community of angels, it's almost like now in my pocket, I know everything the human race has ever known on my smartphone, you know, that, that I have this, all this information in the, in the cloud that you sort of come into the spiritual cloud, which you you absorb all the wisdom of that community. And it feels like it's, it's a part of you there. Um, so that, that's a cool connection. Um, then oh, there's, there's so many specifics, even the ones where people experience negative things. I mean, you, you have, if you, I don't know if you've read Howard Storm's uh, oh, yeah. book. Uh, I, I got to, him too. <laughs> he's, he's great. Yeah. He's so cool. Yeah. I've got to meet him a few times. Um, and so much about even his experience there mirrors what Swedenborg talks about, what he calls crises of the spirit, where we actually go through um, uh, uh, like a loosening or a shaking process where, where what this sort of humbling experience where you can be freed from this negative ego stuff that was in there. Um, even that, uh, you know, seems to sync up really well with that. And just the, uh, the ways that, that people, uh, are, are freed from stuff like that, that Howard's experience was like, okay, I'm, I'm sort of, um, he, Howard Storm says like he was a, among these really negative spirits or people that were, and, but he said, in a way, these were my people. Like they, they, they saw life like I saw life, but it was through sort of getting a mirror on that and then being brought into a state where he really felt a dependence on God that he was able to, um, you know, we have this change of heart, you know, and that, that we go through that in our own little ways that when, when every, when all of my ego plans are working well for me, I find myself very not spiritual. I, I don't really need to pause very much and think about needing help or, or working on myself because I already got everything I need. As soon as things aren't going that well, then I'm like, oh yeah, right. What is, what's, what's up with God? How can I, how can I learn more? So in a way we have these, these little it's it's like exercise. You're breaking down the muscles so that you can you can build them back up. So I see connections in there, um, and then and then just description the descriptions of the spiritual world and the the like I was mentioning before the the dying process that he said he went through and being reawakened with angels. There's a lot of similarities there to what a lot of people will describe uh, in the tunnel. The way the way um, communities are there. The way that even even the way things like water and light seem to have living characteristics to them. Uh, I, I could go on and on. There's, there's a lot of good connection in there. It's not always immediately obvious, but once you really tr uh, dig deep into each set of information, you start to see things that are exciting and really seem to point to like, oh, there's a common reality that people are describing in, in different ways here. And you've brought this up a couple of times and I think about it a lot too. I think one of the important lessons of any spiritual journey is getting away from that ego and looking at how we're all connected. And, and the near-death experience definitely shows us, a lot of us who have that oneness experience with others that, wow, we're really way more connected than we realized. That, you know, when you're doing something to benefit someone else, it really is benefiting you, you know, just on the spiritual level. And that that's an exciting knowing. But it's not a, um, in our culture especially, I think in the American culture, it's not something that is taught a lot. You know, we're taught to be individuals, to go out there and, you know, make our claim in the world. Not that, hey, if you're helping a lot of people, you're going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it seems like it's, but it's almost acknowledged that you don't end up happy. There's all, it's, there's all kinds of movies and books about, oh, I, I had it all, but I wasn't satisfied. We're sort of like, at this dichotomy where we're like, yeah, go, go get yours, but, but getting yours won't do it for you. We don't know. Like there's, there's no good wisdom on it. And the, Swedenborg makes this interesting assertion that, that y you can, it's almost like, you know, I was talking about angels. They really care about motivation rather than uh, results that he, he gave this message of like, you don't, to be spiritual doesn't mean you're, 
you leave society and you're up on a mountain and that's what you do, you can be very spiritual in the things you do and actually m- almost most spiritual in the, the work that you're doing. Like when you're talking about teaching and that you're teaching from a love for the growth and development of those people, then that, because that, that, is, that is sort of the core of heaven. He says, at, it, at its essence, the heavenly mindset is peace and joy and all these things. But what that's founded on is the idea that you are doing something useful for other people, that that's the joy that can be cultivated and sustained. And you can do any number of things in that. Like right now, you and I are doing a, a video interview and I could be coming on here because I'm like, oh, I just want to just get as famous as I can. Like more people will see me here. How, how, what, what's the, how can I get as many views as I can? Um, but I could be also giving the same interview thinking about, okay, is, is anything going to come out of my mouth that's going to be helpful to somebody? And, and thinking about, like, like you're doing with your book and that guy who's going to read it and, and he's going to get his life changed. If you're writing that book, thinking about that guy, then that's a very spiritual thing that you're doing there. You know, um, so it's like you, you could still do something do, do all kinds of things that people do in society. Not everything I think would make the cut, but there's like, if we can change the motivation and then also like the priorities, he talks about uh, if the difference between the position serving you versus you serving the position. Like if I want to be the mayor of a town because I want a place of honor at the table, I want to be famous. I want to control things. I want kickbacks. Um, that's upside down. But if, if I, I can still try hard to get that position, if I'm thinking, well, as mayor, right now I can do some things to affect social change, but as the mayor, I can really get some programs that you can, you can be going for that, but it's all about why, what do you want to, what do you want to do with it? You know, um, right. which, yeah, so, and, so a couple of thoughts. that's where it's fascinating where spirit works. So we think, I, I've noticed this and we're like, if I think, oh, I'm going to do it this way. And I focus too much on, even if it's a good motivation, uh, that might not be how it happens. So instead of being mayor, you know, maybe this person needs to start a business or start a yeah. platform talking or, you know, that there's many different ways that they can bring that same energy to help others, but it may not be the concept that they're thinking they have to do. And that's a hundred percent for the record. Like I, I, architected or masterminded like absolutely none of getting me to where I am I, when I was in school I told you I was like going for biology and then I, I thought okay well I switched to communications because I'll still try to do conservation work but through that I then I got like and I, at the time I wasn't even thinking I would do anything Swedenborg related like I was reading Swedenborg and getting more into that and, and really needing it to, to help me get through my day to day but I never thought I would do that for a job I didn't think I would be like a <clears throat> like even like oh, I'm going to talk about religious stuff in public or spiritual stuff in public. I don't think I want to do that. Like that's, 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 that's embarrassing or something. But, but I got a job offer from a different organization and I was like, okay, well maybe I'll try it out. But even the stuff within Swedenborg Foundation, like I told you about that Facebook page that, uh, that, that took off, that kind of started it. I didn't think it would take off like that. I was sort of trying to do something else and then it went in this direction. And with these videos, I, I, when we started our, our most popular show, Swedenborg in Life, was actually supposed to be something that killed time while I was working on a different project for people. But then that took off. It just seems like um, that you can see that there's a, there's a bigger plan kind of moving the levers. And I love what you're saying about don't get too attached to outcomes and that this is how it's going to be. And this is a huge thing in the mindset Swedenborg describes. It's like you can try with all your might to do things, but he has this beautiful description of people who are in what he calls the stream of providence, which is this trusting of, of God, which is not that you're not trying to do things, but, but if you don't get what you're trying to do, you're not downcast. And if you do get what you're trying to do, you don't feel like you're better than other people, that you know that God is working things out for everybody's uh, best, you know, equi- equifinality, the best ending for everyone. So it's like this cool balance between I'm trying to do things, but I'm not, I'm not demanding control. And, and it's like, I'm going to work hard at my position, but God is project manager. And if, if he says we go in this direction, then okay, we go in that direction, which is a tough, tough balance, but it's what I like try to aspire to. And in little moments, I'll get it here and there. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of a saying, you know, at the end of death, my father said something that I felt was wise, but I didn't like it at the time, he said, everything has a way of working out for the best. And <laughs> I was like, you're dying at 62, broke with a brain tumor. This is not the best. 
horrible. You know, yeah. you know, nursing home with no money to leave me. And you know, yeah. I, mean, I was looking at it from, from this perspective of, oh, this is not the best. But then later, who knew that I'd start using his wisdom from the other side, that I'd connect with him in that way that things would just work out in this way that he's with me on this journey in spirit. And, and it is for the best. I mean, you know, there's that, that part of my story, I think is important to people because not everybody relates to a near death experience, but everybody's going to lose someone at some point. Yeah. And I think that that's very relatable, that it's a, it's a humbling part of life that that loss. And as we talked earlier, you know, that's what brings a lot of people to these topics is, is their loss, how to deal with it. And, uh, and so, yeah, everything has a way of working out for the best. I, I try to embrace that, that idea, but it, we get caught up in the physical. It doesn't look like it, but on that spiritual level, when you're looking at it later, it certainly does look like it. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's such a cool that, that you could take that phrase with you. Um, I, I had a, a grandfather who, died before I was born. Uh, so I never got to met him. Actually, my middle name is, is, is his name. Um, and, uh, but as he was dying, he was getting sick and, and couldn't talk anymore. I was just told. And, um, and uh, my grandmother, you know, his wife was saying to him, like, what, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Cause we didn't know, was he going to die soon? Was he going to die later? And he just um, wrote on a piece of paper cause he couldn't talk. He wrote, um, I hope the Lord will use me as his best for everyone. And I, and I carry that phrase with me, like, because, and I find it that interestingly enough, that's like a defense for me against my own fears and worries and concerns, because all those things are coming at me saying like, you're in danger in this way. If you don't succeed at this, uh, your life is not turning out well in this way. Uh, Are you going to miss an opportunity or something like that? If I say like, I hope the Lord will use me as his best for everyone. Suddenly it's like, oh, I'm not. Uh, it just, I'm not, I don't care. I don't care how it turns out for me in that way that, that, that it just introduces this idea of there's a bigger game and we're all in this together. So I love little phrases like that and, and what they, what they grow to mean that just get delivered to us in these, in these moments, you know? Oh, I love that too. That's kind of a beautiful place to actually end this, that the Lord will use and say it for me one more time. The Lord I, I, I hope the Lord will use me as his best for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. And that really, that, that makes you rise to the occasion too, the best for everyone. You know, yeah. It's a different way of uh, being good for this world and, and with a, a good connection. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for talking with me and for uh, being here today. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And for those who want to check out the links below, please do. I will have the links to your channel, your YouTube channel and website, and then the links to the next Near-Death Experience Summit, which does have Dr. Raymond Moody, Dr. Jeffrey Long, uh, Howard Storm, John Burke, uh, Lisa Smart, Leslie Lupo, Nancy Ryan, so many different people. I'm not going to list them all, but it will be a lot of fun behind the scenes. I've been working hard, so I hope you'll check that out. (laughs) But thank you very much.